She runs. Well, good evening. Welcome to another edition of My Junk is Stuff Garage. Got a really cool set for you tonight. Set, and I've actually had it for a couple of years now, but um, it's been really sitting in the same condition, stage, whatever you want to say, since since when I got it. I, I mean, I did a little few things to it, but we'll jump right in. What we've got tonight is a 1935 Lionel Red Comet set. So this is the first year of the set. Red Comet set was offered for two years. Dose, two years. And they were both different. Both had actually a lot of differences. Um, so this is the first year of the set. Uh, so what I've got is the local tender and, and three passenger cars. They're all original. <laughs> I don't have set box. I don't have individual boxes. Um, they're not mint. I mean, come on. Uh, but they're pretty decent. Um, this this thing's pretty good. Um, like I said, it's all original. Um, even the wheels and the cab, and those are probably the two items on particularly Lionel uh, trained steam engines of that era, and the cab on 265Es because it's cast. Uh, those are the two items that uh, are known to have uh, what's called zinc pest problems, right? Where they uh, the material degrades and, and fractures and, and so forth. Um, I could probably put a whole other video together talking about what's actually going on in, in the metallurgy as far as uh, that goes, but, but we'll leave that for another time. So this is the 1935 set. Um, it's unique. The cab is different in 1935 and 1936. Uh, the 35 cab does not have firebox doors on it. It's a little bit lighter. 36, they, they added firebox doors, so there's a difference there. Uh, doesn't have a, a headlight ring. 36 does have a headlight ring. The drivers are different. They have nickeled rims on 35. Um, and so in 36, they do not. So there, there's just, you know, you can go on and on. The cars have the black belly tanks in 35. And in 36, they had evolved to the cars that had the red fish bellies or the uh, you know, underbellies instead of instead of tanks. Um, so again, <laughs> those are like the major differences. Uh, like serious hardcore collectors probably point out some uh, several more things even beyond that. Uh, and, and I guess I didn't even mention probably one of the major things that the shade of the red paint used between the 35 set and the 36 set they're different, two different shades. So they're completely different. You set one beside the other, it's night and day. Uh, 35 set is is more red uh, 36 set is is I in my view more of the uh, kind of vermilion red color with, with more of a uh, more of an orange type hue to it um, so what we'll do so I when I got this set um, local wheels were in bad shape and so one of, one of the things that I've uh, over the years have done has is picked up quite a few of these uh, locomotives, but um, I'll save wheels, right? So uh, when I get, you know, if I get a motor that's got two good wheels on it and two bad ones, well, I don't just jump all four wheels, obviously, right? So, and, and hopefully I, I think most people are like that, but um, that allows me to uh, kind of scavenge, if you will, and I'll go through this, and that's what the video will cover, going through cleaning the motor the e-unit all those types of things uh, getting those wheels uh, picking out the wheels that are still in good shape and not swollen and that don't whine and, and whatever and mesh mesh good with the gears and getting those all reinstalled correctly um, so again when I'm done everything will be original all the side rods all the wheels everything uh, so sit back and enjoy I hope you like it 
And so here is my aforementioned 1935 version of the Lionel uh, Red Comet with a 264E, a red 261E tender, 261T tender, uh, two unlighted 603, and one unlighted 604 passenger car. So the 603s are the Pullmans, 604 is the observation. Um, so hopefully you'll get an idea of the color. Okay, again, I've said this is a 1935 version, so I'll show you some of those specific details. So 1935, the uh, steam shroud was painted, uh, color of the loco. Um, you have no uh, chrome headlight ferrule. You have chrome rimmed drivers. Okay. And in the back, the cab does not have um, firebox doors. Okay. So that's just for starters. Of course, in 1935, the 261T tender that came standard with this set was, was a one-year only item. In 1936, they used the waffle tender. That was because they could put a whistle in it, of course. So here's, here's the bottom of the tender now. And it correctly comes with a black frame. Brass plates, nickel ladder. Okay. Trying to get all those details there. And the trucks are the, uh, what would you call them, the 2650 series freight car trucks. Uh, and they were also used on the small passenger cars. But uh, the, the point here is to recognize that um, they did not use the same O gauge trucks on this tender that they did on the passenger cars. And that, that is correct that way. Okay, so again, these passenger cars, uh, the style of lettering here with Lionel lines over the windows and Pullman, and you can see the black uh, tanks underneath with the chrome caps. The later cars used a body colored uh, belly tank, or not tank, but belly uh, uh, piece. and. You can also see the nickel journals on these style of trucks and the single uh, flat plate uh, separating bar or spreader bar uh, that, that keeps the trucks together. Um, you can see how the couples are held into the body shell. Okay. And correctly, the observation will have the nickel railings, okay, uh, nickel or painted silver either way, um, and of course the same same type of details, and these cars have the uh, the flat, flat yeah, profile uh, roof screw as well, okay. So, so that's basically what we got. So, again, I picked this set up several years ago, probably five or six years ago, in in this condition. Um, I and it did come with the side rods on the truck or on the loco and the lead in the trailing truck. Uh, I've got them in a little plastic baggie somewhere. As I've been uh, anticipating the work on the motor uh, to get uh, four good drive wheels on it that are not uh, falling apart. Um, so anyway, so that's that's where we're at. So what we're going to do in this video is we're going to uh, well get that motor back in shape, get the drive wheels installed correctly, um, then try and uh, clean and polish. And probably uh, not going to get too extensive with these uh, cars. Probably just going to uh, give them a, a light cleaning and some wax on the uh, on the outer outer portions of it. Uh, we may polish the wheels. Um, I'll show you how I do that. There's many ways, of course, and not suggesting one way is better than another, but but we'll we'll talk about it a little bit. So anyway, so that's the uh, 
that's the setting question. That's my set that we're going to be uh, cleaning up here. All right, so here we go. I'm gonna I'm gonna break all the rules of uh, you know you shouldn't use your layout as a workbench. So I have just put uh, a single screw back in to hold this motor in the loco while uh, I was doing the introduction, and so this is how you remove the motor from a Commodore Vanderbilt. Okay. Take that back screw out, and then this uh, headlight piece, I've already taken that off, but you can see there is a little clip that that would, uh, well, piece of sheet metal that that clip would uh, be installed on. So you just pull all that out. And that all slides in that way. So what you have is you have a couple of recessed areas right here and right here that these two front pins or tabs, if you will, on the motor slide into and then when you wiggle that all down then the back piece can be screwed down here. This bottom piece retains the pen for the drawbar and it screws into the bottom of the die cast cab and it also retains the rear corners of the sheet metal boiler. So a lot of times when the cabs start coming apart you'll lose this uh, uh, drawbar uh, strap um, or it'll be kind of skewed and spread all over the place. The other thing you tend to lose when the cabs start coming apart is they'll break right here because these, uh, I'll try to spin that around so you can see it, the uh, number plates have little tabs on them on the inside as well. So, I'm, so on all these uh, pieces up here you can see I'm missing my smokestack um, but they all are retained with little bendable tabs and so on an original loco just just for clarity on an original loco steam chests will be uh, same color as the boiler the boiler is red in inside and out however there is a piece of sheet metal inside that the one that the motor uh, mounts to, so to speak, that is uh, chemically blackened. It's not painted black, it's chemically blackened. So if you've got one that is painted body color, uh, that's a telltale that your local has been repainted. Now, obviously there'll be other telltale things. Usually people do a bad job of covering up stuff like the retaining pens. They might not pull these uh, guides off for the side rods, um, all types of things. Uh, another example of that, uh, these rivets here are what hold the steam chest and that inner plate to the outside shell. On a repaint, those will usually be painted over as well. So, by no means is my loco anywhere near perfect. Um, and again, I, as before, I hesitate to make my own judgments on, you know, conditioning and so forth. But to me, this is uh, very usable. Now this, the cab is, is in one piece, however, you can certainly see, you can see all these little, uh, what do you want to call them, bumps? Looks like it's got the measles or something. So that, that can be kind of typical of one of these old cabs, even, even one that's holding in one piece and is not, not starting to swell, okay? Now I'll go through a couple of quick differences uh, between the wheels on a 264E and a 265, at least the early wheels, and maybe some of the later wheels. Okay, so these were among some of the first that Lionel cast that have the gear teeth as part of the casting. Okay, and if you look at these, well, these just have a five on them. 
but some of them actually have 264 dash something cast in the back side of them. So they are a zinc alloy die casting and they have a rim on them as, as you may be familiar with a lot of other Lionel Ro Locos. Lionel was fond of putting metal rims on their cast wheels, probably for good reason. Um, so these on the first year Commodore Vanderbilts, the 1935s especially, had a nickeled rim that wrapped around wrapped around the front face of the wheel. And that's reminiscent of your earlier locos like 260s, 265, or 255Es, 262s, and so forth. Um, and so that that's kind of you can you can kind of follow the lineage of design changes through through their time frame. Okay. So the other thing to notice is these wheels, uh, neither one of them has a boss for a side uh, drive rod. Okay. And that's okay because remember the 264E doesn't have uh, doesn't have an eccentric gear on it like I just showed. Now here's here for comparison's sake is a 1935 265E on top and my 264E motor on the bottom. And you will see this drive gear post on the 265E motor on the rear driver. If you look very closely, you will notice that there are flat spots at the very tip of that post, and that is to locate the uh, eccentric gear um, piece that, that screws down there so that it does not just spin blindly, okay? And so again, the difference between a 264 and 265E motor in the first year of production, both with nickel rims, but one has a drive rod post and the other does not. Okay, when you move to the next couple of years, um, you get combinations of blackened wheels, and then you also have some that have uh, you have some of these that have what's called the thin rim or thin nickel rim. Okay, so I'm just kind of just kind of showing you this for reference sake. All right. So on our loco, what I've got to do, I've got uh, what seems to be four good wheels, and so yeah, kind of. Get that in focus there. So you can kind of, there, there's no binding or seemingly no binding. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go uh, press these wheels on, make sure I get them square, um, and make sure that they're uh, timed correctly, and uh, whatever you want to call it. And uh, then we'll come back and we'll see how that looks. All right, let's see how this goes. Taking this motor apart. Looks like these wires are just twisted together. Oops, don't want to lose my wheel. Okay, so there's, there's the headlight wire, and this is the little bracket. This is specific to uh, a couple of engines besides the 264 and 265E, but that's where you'll see it a lot. So you got to have that guy. Don't want to lose it. All right. I'll separate these two wires. One of these is uh, the center rail pickup wire. Ooh, that feels pretty. Feels like it's gonna. Feels like that. Ah, we'll leave that for right now. Okay. All right. So that's that. All right. around so you can see it. And I'm going to undo the unit screw. Keep that there. Notice these big binding head screws for the brush plate. Now let's listen to that snap when I break that loose. 
You hear that? The first one was a little more pronounced, but that's a nice sign. Okay. So this is your, your typical Lionel pre-war and even on some early post-war brush plate. You'll see them installed this way, flat side out, and there is actually some applications where, you're, where you will see them installed the opposite direction. So I pull that up, fold it out of the way. Here's my, my two brushes. Okay, and I can actually pull, pull the armature out. You see that's in prime condition, practically mint. Uh, no need to be clean there. Ha ha ha, kidding, of course. Uh, so we'll do uh, we'll do some cleaning on that little guy, and uh, so that's that's one detail there. And so for the uh, for the brush plate, you'll notice there are the wires going to the brushes from the E unit. Obviously, there's two of them, and on these there are little screws. So I just typically will break that loose and of course they're they're looped around so I'll open that up just enough to get the wire out okay and I'll do that on both sides Let's see it's that one I can't even see it that one looks like it's been kind of yeah that was a little funky so all right, so there's kind of a close-up of the brush plate. You can see there's a lot of a lot of oily gunk in there and so forth, and a lot of dirt and gunk on the tubes, probably inside as well as out. So we'll clean all that stuff up as well. And you can see there's a whole butt ton of dirt and gunk, debris inside the motor block there where the uh, armature and so forth is so we'll do all that as well you can also go over here to the back side pop these loose okay there we go so there's my little retainer for well it's for the the outer I guess gear side armature bearing uh, bracket. How's that? That's probably the proper nomenclature. And you can see it's got a brass bushing in there. So we'll obviously we'll clean that up. And these gears, there's the Uno and there's the other. Of course they're all oily and dirty so we'll clean those up and you can see we've got a mountain of eh, maybe over lubrication. We'll see. Whatever. We'll clean all that up. Um, you can see on this one, pickup rollers don't look too bad, look pretty good. A lot of times what you find on these early motors is uh, the spring plate on the pickup is usually damaged in some sense. Uh, people will have a bad habit of taking a pair of pliers and trying to tweak these to try and get added pressure on their pickup to keep it down on the rail. Uh, and sometimes they can do more more harm than good. Um, so you wanna you wanna monitor and keep the integrity of that. Actually, you can see this back end. That's somebody has done that. You can see there's a crease in there. So I'll probably try and uh, straighten that out, or I shouldn't say straighten, but uh, massage that a little bit to get it back where it should be. So you wanna check the integrity of your spring, your rollers. Um, and the fiber plate. I guess one thing to note on these pre-war motors, and I think this is probably something that Lionel learned and corrected post-war, um, all these pre-war motors, the roller and the pin were one piece. And what that meant was is that the pin was spinning in, the, uh, in this little clip or bracket on the you know end of the uh, pickup roller or pickup bar whatever you want to call it and unfortunately uh, these wear 
the you know the side plate will wear as that pen spins. The pen is harder. Obviously, it's the same material. It's one piece and same material as the roller. The roller is, uh, you know, a fairly hard material that's going to resist wear because heck, it's a roller. It's supposed to pick. You know, it's got current going through it and all the other. What Lionel learned post-war is that they made their they started making the rollers hollow, and the bar that the roller rode on was then staked into the pickup bracket. You'll find that on like your turbines, your F3s, your Berkshires and so forth. So that's what you would call a design product improvement. Uh, took them the whole pre-war time period to get around to figuring that out. But um, between you, me and the wall, that's one thing. If I was gonna make a, a modification to a pre-war motor, uh, that's that's something I would consider, and I wouldn't wouldn't do it in an ugly fashion to like remove the whole bracket or anything like that. I would just my my thought would be to uh, fashion some rollers that had a through hole in them and used a bar that I could stake into the existing components, so it wouldn't damage the looks or anything like that. So okay, so that's that. Um, oh, I gotta pull the E unit out, so you just pull that guy right out. And so you can see here, this is the wire that goes down to the center rail pickup. Not sure how that's coming through there. And this wire here is the hot side of the, the field winding. So the, the ground side is grounded to the motor frame for the field. Uh, and so the hot, uh, or yeah, hot side here goes to the top set of fingers okay so I'll probably do that off camera here but uh, then the last thing I want to note is of course you have the drum in the E unit the this is called the, the pawl and the ratchet when you put those two things together so the solenoid when you energize it picks this pawl up and it grabs a tooth and that spins the drum basically one tooth at a time so that's what's happening every time you turn power on and turn it off and so when that spins the drum uh, you can see that the drum has two copper sides and they have basically that they have two sets of fingers if you see one set like this and one set like this at 90 degrees from each other and so the way the fingers are aligned, we call these <laughs> we call these fingers in here. Maybe when I take this part, I'll take a quick video showing that better. Um, the way they're aligned when the drum spins, that's what gives you forward and reverse on AC power. Um, so that's that's pretty simple. So that's a quick disassembly of a 264E Red Comet motor. Well, there you have it. So far, I've Taken, uh, given a brief description uh, of the Red Comet set, the 1935 Lionel Red Comet set um, overview. Uh, kind of shown a few of the details here and there. Uh, taken the loco apart, pulled the motor out, showed you how to do that. And I've taken the uh, taken the motor completely apart, um, including the uh, you know E unit armature and everything else. So I think what I'm going to do this is getting kind of long. So uh, and I like showing all those details. Um, I guess we'll find out if, if you guys like that as well. And I'm going to break this into, I'm not sure if it's going to be two or three sections. Uh, it might just be two. It kind of depends. Uh, I've already got a bunch of the shots and stuff done for uh, cleaning the motor, working through it, and starting to put it back together. And I want to talk uh, a good bit about the uh, reverse unit, the E unit, and show all of those details of its construction and how it works. Uh, Pretty clear. I don't think I've seen any good videos online that, that really delve into that. There probably are some, but uh, you know, there's so many out there. But anyway, I, I wanted to go through it just for my own in entertainment. Um, so look for one, maybe two more uh, videos on this. And like I say, we'll get get the local put back together and run it in great shape, and get the cars all cleaned up and everything. And I'll have to clean my layout up too. That's probably the biggest problem. Probably the probably take the longest of anything. And then get some good shots of it running around the layout. So that's what you got to look forward to. So 
Thanks and uh, hope you stick around.